dudes. Let's get this show on the road then, so. Uh, hello everybody. Just checking that everything is working. Before we get started. Okay, so I'm just gonna hang out still for a second, wait for people to tune in. Uh, see if all of the technology is working. Seems pretty okay. Uh, so don't worry, you won't have to look at me throughout the entire presentation. Uh, my talks are generally a little bit more basic in nature with a basic PowerPoint presentation and me just talking over it. Um, first of all, because I'm way too nervous to sit in a chair and talk for over an hour, so I'm going to have to turn off the video later and then just start walking up and down in my tiny office. And also I just don't have really this amazing next level computer skills that have most of the presenters have that you can see the presentations on the internet at the moment. So uh, just to give you a bit of an idea, so this is going to be not like a general history of Sci Mountain, it will be mostly how I experienced the evolution of Sci Mount. And, uh, and ah, okay, I'm a bit silent. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna crank up the volume a little bit. Thanks for letting me know. So, uh, it's basically just my general experience of side mountain, like how I came into it, how I experienced the evolution here in Mexico and worldwide. And I'm gonna give you some idea about my point of view. So, that does not necessarily reflect the opinion of all the manufacturers or of all the people involved, but this is just like my point of view. Um, the PowerPoint presentation is going to have like about 20 slides, 15, 16 slides, and we're going to talk over it. Uh, so it's going to be almost like a podcast. And uh, maybe in the future, I'm going to get a little bit better with computers and then I'm going to prepare something a bit more entertaining. But good. Uh, now, if we have already quite some people online, so let's just start right into it. I'm going to take the video off and then walk you through the slideshow. I hope you enjoy it. Good. So now I'm on the headphones. It's going to be a bit more relaxing for me. Good. You can really not, like, even if I just do this from my point of view, and and I talk mostly about Mexico, yet we cannot talk about side mounting without first honoring some of these giants uh, that came before us because we're truly standing on the shoulders of these giants. And so as most of you know, side mounting is actually quite old, let's say, or like way older than most people think. Um, and it started like way uh, in, the, in the 60s in sump diving. So just to give you a bit of an idea what sump diving is. So obviously people explored dry caves for much more time than that. But until that moment, many times while they explored a dry cave, they would arrive at a water filled corner waterfield passage of that cave and it would be named the terminal sump or a sump that would end in water and exploration was abandoned. Um, at some point, however, the curiosity of explorers that were wondering what was behind that sump outweigh their uh, sense of self-preservation, I reckon. And so they started inventing equipment and using diving equipment to try and pass those water filled sums to get to the other side and keep on exploring the dry cave. Now, to a certain degree, sum diving is quite different from the cave diving that we do here in Mexico, as in many times the sump is actually seen as an obstacle rather than something that you go to enjoy. So also from an equipment configuration, procedures and protocols, sum diving very often varies quite massively from what we consider like mainstream cave diving here in Mexico. Of course, I'm not gonna tell you all of the people that were involved in this, but some that were important for me, for example, uh, I wanna start with a guy from the UK, of course, because that's also where it hailed from. So Martin Farr, um, the first experience that I had from Martin Farr about side mounting was his book, The Darkness Beckons. I guess most cave divers or side mount divers have seen that one before and I was purely in awe about the pictures and the stories 
in his book. And then I was lucky enough to meet him also in person uh, in a dive site in Mexico. And uh, every once in a while, we are in touch on Facebook, which is, of course, amazing for me because he's a true hero of mine. Uh, then Woody Jaspers. So many would consider him to be like the birth of side mount diving in Florida or in the States. Uh, anecdotally, he had, or that's what I was told, he had a motorcycle accident, which stopped him a little bit from using conventionally big sized steel doubles and started to switch to what was back then referred to as like the English style. So carrying the tanks on his sides which I guess at the beginning was most likely ridiculed. However, when he started to explore caves that were formerly thought to be walled out and suddenly there was new lines and new tunnels, this of course caught the attention of many explorers or cave divers at the time. And I guess one of them must have been Wes Giles, which is the third person in this picture, who was really a very, very avid uh, cave diver and explorer, part of a very big exploration group and and also was one of the first persons to really quality high quality wise document the underwater caves uh, with both still photography and video uh the next person that i would uh think of or that that when it comes then to like gear design um would be lamar Harris for me that um started with like the the you know organizing all of the the equipment that was out there like for example Renica also that you see in the left picture that started with like creating butt plates and harnesses stories uh start from like seat belts uh stitched together and d-rings added and and i think lamar was there at the time to absorb and see all of those things and ultimately conceived in the 90s the first commercially sold side mount usable equipment i would say so this was the trans pack which basically was a one thing can do it all type of harness the idea was you could use it on a single tank uh, you could be able to use it with double cylinders and ultimately you could move the wing to the inside and use it in side mount we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in detail in a second uh, then rick stanton of course uh, I, I felt when i did the slides there was too many americans and i have to bring some some europeans in the mix uh, Rick Stanton to all of us cave divers and explorers has been a legend for, I don't know, several decades uh, and ultimately became, I guess, one of the most famous cave divers in the world after the Thai rescue that he literally spearheaded. Uh, he also happens to be an unbelievable friendly bloke, uh, which I had the great honor to meet him on, the, on a, a di technical diving conference not too long ago. And it's really cool to hang out and, and to get his point of view about cave exploration. It's just so interesting when you read about projects all around the world that were ongoing for the last 30 years and there's almost no corner in the world where his name doesn't pop up. Uh, personal hero of mine would be next, Brian K. Cook. Uh, he was the, the first manual I ever read about. Side mount diving came from him, uh, side mounting and no mounting from INTD. And I also had the great pleasure and honor to dive with him in Bahamas. Um, for those of you that are waiting for the COVID thing to be over and to experience some next level cave diving. If you've never been to the Bahamas, besides that it would be like a cave diving trip of a lifetime. Uh, he was rattled by not only the COVID virus, but before that a uh, really massive hurricane that devastated pretty much all the Bahamas. So your trip there would not only be good for you, but also good for them. Um, then uh, two other guys, uh, Ed Sorensen, for example, that uh, is, too many known as the ad mods, right? The, one of the guys that is a true thinker and thinker and that always took existing equipment and then modified it to his needs and came up with really uh, good ideas and interesting ideas on how to modify the equipment and make it more suitable for his type of diving. And then I would end, like to end up with Brad Hempel, which for me, his armadillo harness uh, Truly for me, like from my point of view, would be the first commercially available sidebound harness that was predominantly derived or designed for sidebound diving. Of course, you could have also used it with back mounting and with uh, rebreathers. It also used, let's say, like a more back mount design styled wing, but it has things incorporated like the butt plate, a uh, new different way of routing the, 
corrugated holes, which now became sort of standard, and uh, many other things that made it, and from my point of view, like the first, this is really mostly supposed to be used for side mount type of equipment. Good. After we paid our respects, uh, let's start from my personal journey. So my first exposure to side mounting was in my first Mexico trip in 2005 when I came to ProTech and I did uh, my first side mount class. Something a bit funny about that, for most of you that have been to Mexico frequently, I'm pretty sure you have seen uh, the line arrows that say T and A on it. So that's Torsten and Alex, a German couple. And actually Alex was the second student of my sideband class. So already back then I was pretty lucky to be getting teamed up with some really important people. <clears throat> then I went back to Egypt, which was my home base at the time. I lived in Egypt for about five years. And in Egypt actually, I found a cave that had this really small restriction and being a 21 year old dive master or 22 year old, uh, uh, 21, 22 year old diving instructor. When I saw the restriction, I did not know anything about cave diving. So basically put myself in a pretty life threatening situation when I passed the restriction with a single tank on my back, turned around and got engulfed in zero visibility. I didn't have cave training, I didn't have line, I didn't have proper light, and I thought that I'm going to die, which ultimately led to my first trip to Mexico to become cave trained. Funny enough, now, you know, being weaponized with all the tools to explore that cave, uh, and very excited, I came back to pass that restriction and then lay line on the other side, only to find out that even with my new techniques, the restriction was pretty small and I thought I'm going, to, I'm going to die again and abandon that project. But so I used side mounting in 2006 also a little bit in the ocean throughout uh, Egypt. Then in 2007, in March, I finally made the move to Mexico. And at the time to become a cave diving instructor, uh, we all were told that you needed to have all of the specialties uh, of cave diving, because obviously, you know, if you want to be a cave uh, diving instructor, you should be very well rounded in all of the different techniques that cave diving had to offer. So I tried to mix and match as much as I could between the different techniques. Good. So my first rig, or as I call it, the Transpac era. Now, when you look at the right hand side picture, you get that idea of having the harness on the outside and then the wing on the inside. So the idea was to use the harness to streamline the wing as much as possible. However, there was quite some problem with this wing sandwich. First of all, the getting dressed part. As you can see, the top part of the wing wasn't attached to the shoulder straps. So quite frequently when you try to get dressed, one of the ears of the wing would end up somewhat halfway down on your lower back. And of course, we're all way too proud to ask somebody to help us. So now you're like half looking into your car window's reflection of yourself, trying to get that ear out while you're in a dry suit. Uh, you're sweating bullets because it's you know Mexican summer and you're trying to figure out to get into your own harness, which is you know a little bit embarrassing at that moment. Besides that, you can imagine, so we wanted to have the wing as tight to the body as possible, right? Because the main concept of side mounting at that time was to pass through small cave. That's what the main application for us was. So now the problem is if you make the harness really tight, right? And we use different parts of the harness to restrain the ring, the shoulder straps, uh, the bungee that rus runs across your back to keep the tanks in place, and of course the waist strap. So now the problem was as you try to inflate it to jump in the water or to put your side mount tanks on, the wing squeezed you. So just imagine getting a really, really strong hug from your own diving equipment and you basically start the dive hardly being able to inhale. And it was everything else but entertaining to be honest. To be perfectly honest with you, I really hated it. Not so much the equipment, just the whole equipment configuration, the whole dive, side mount diving itself. The next issue would be that once you would then go underwater and deflate, suddenly everything would be loose, right? First, you almost broke your thumbs to get the bungee over the tank necks. And suddenly the tanks would float around and 
be jiggly and wiggly, which was not really what we wanted. We wanted our equipment always to be like an extension of our body, right? You move, your equipment moves with you. However, what was the good part about it? It was readily available equipment, right? You could actually purchase it. Uh, a lot of people already had it. So from that point of view, you know, the diving uh, group or like uh, us divers, we were so different back then because, you know, spending heaps amount of money on a hobby wasn't really what most people did. So we would get like, you know, you wouldn't want to not stop using an equipment or buying more equipment, right? The idea was to have a few things that can do it all to keep the cost of your hobby to an overseeable limit. Besides the whole dressing and undressing, there were some additional issues like the trim, for example. So all of the, the wing ideas, right? If you have the, uh, a round shaped wing, a donut uh, wing gym or a horseshoe shaped wing, the idea was always to help the diver to have enough head to toe trim capability to deal with the really heavy first stages and manifold that was really high up behind the diver's head. Suddenly, all of this weight was moved down quite significantly into the armpits, thus changing the center of gravity way further down on the diver's body. So suddenly you had all of this lift behind your shoulders that was in the wrong place. It wasn't really necessary any longer. So as you can see in the picture, this was almost like a default thing. Like most people on Armadillo, on, on the Transpex, had these quite big weights on divers' shoulders to basically simulate the weight of the first stages and manifold that had been lost by changing the tank orientation or changing the tank location. So we would refer to that as an equipment solution to a design or technique problem. Besides that, you can imagine when you dive small cave, everything that's soft, webbing, bungee, uh, rubber, it can twist, it can turn, you can break it if you put muscle to it. However, metal such as D-rings or, or lead, you, you wedge that into rock, that's that ultimate nightmare that people have sometimes when they think about cave diving. Like you wouldn't go back and you wouldn't go forward anymore. So this was one of the issues that we had, that we had to add this weight simply to help us out with trim. The next part would be the wear and tear. Now, again, back then, literally, let's say 95% of people that went into side mounting did that to dive small cave. Now, one thing that you will realize quite fast when you dive small cave is that the biggest part of your body is the width of your shoulders and the distance from your chest plates to your shoulder blades. Now, I know some of you might look down on yourself and go like, no, Patrick, you're completely wrong. My belly is definitely bigger than my shoulders. And that might be true. However, the belly is all soft, right? You can suck it in. <laughs> you can squeeze it through. That's not the problem. But bone is bone and bone happens to be quite unflexible. So the one thing that we realized that was limiting us in how small of a cave we could dive would be how much stuff we would have on our shoulder blades. Hence, all of this top 10%, 20% of the wing not only put lift in the wrong place, but it also was the most vulnerable part of the equipment. And I remember, for example, my business partner, Kim Davidson, used to have an armadillo in like the top at least 30% basically consisted out of Aquasil to keep it all together. So the next part was also, you can see in the picture was that 90 degree elbow that came out of the wing and into the corrugated hose that ran over the shoulder. Now this definitely comes from back mounting as the first stage of course was higher than the wing. So already there, we had some issues with the hose routing as well as diving really small cave. And the moment you would have, I think specifically the pickpocket restrictions in Grand Cenote downstream. In the moment you would have to turn your head to the side to pass through a restriction, your ear would be right next to that 90 degree elbow and you would hear it grinding on the cave ceiling. And I don't know how that made other people feel, but it scared me a lot. And I didn't like that idea at all of making a hole, especially in that part and then losing all of the gas of my wing through the top section. So ultimately, at this point in time, we really only had either self-made 
or sort of like or commercially available Florida style rigs. And I guess there's just a difference from that point of view between Floridian style maybe and, and Mexican style, if you even want to split it like that, is our rock here, as you can see in this other picture that we took very recently, we have in Mexico a lot of chemical erosion uh, because our caves have low to no flow. So a lot of the erosion of the rock is done through chemistry, which leaves this really scarce, sharp, uh, edgy, we call it Velcro rock. We call it Velcro rock because if you get close to it, it will attach itself to you and then you will drag it with you. So one of the really cool lines that came from Matt was leave the unnecessary and modify the necessary. So everything that you wouldn't need for the dive, you would leave behind because ultimately you're just gonna get hung up with it. So this was a quite big difference towards Floridian style that at the time was really big on like, you know, a lot of D-rings, a lot of accessories, a lot of buckles, a lot of uh, webbing and, and other uh, extra things to it, which, which is not very appealing to us, right? Um, there many, many times, not always, but many times in Florida due to the flow the surfaces of the rock is way smoother. So even when something protrudes, you might have an easier time sliding through it. Of course, that's a generalization. It's not always like that, but just to give an idea of how, you know, we considered any extra D-ring to be not good and, and there uh, as many D-rings seem to be sometimes the, the best solution. So maybe the environment is, is a good ex explanation to why the designs seem to differ from each other. Then a very important moment in my life happened was when I met Steve Bogarts for the first time. Throughout my diving career, I had taken the choice of my diving instructors always very, very important. And in the same time, you know, I'm like 23, 24 years old. So through that, you know, wrong self perception based on youth, no matter who I was in the water with, I have to shamelessly admit that I always thought one day I'm going to be better than you. And that could have been in regards to teaching or that could have been in regards to diving. I just felt deep inside myself the confidence that because of my age difference and my attitude and my motivation, that one distant uh, part in the future, one distant point in the future, I'm going to be better than the person that taught me at that moment. That basically drastically ended in the moment I met Steve Bogarts. <laughs> Uh, he was definitely exactly the definition of what I would have considered a role model in diving. First of all, his physical fitness. Uh, we went to the same gym also at night and I saw the amount of weight he lifted. Uh, he spoke unbelievable eloquently when he gave theory presentations. Uh, you propel your body through the water column. I mean, who says something like that? And it sounded just so awesome. And of course, his amazing in-water skill, uh, almost sometimes when you have it looked like it was just painted into, into the background, it was really, really impressive. So uh, I had the great honor and pleasure to assist Steve on some cave courses. And then <clears throat> the day happened when my phone is ringing. And I remember like yesterday, I'm standing on the balcony of mom's hotel is where I lived at the time. And Steve's on the phone and he goes like, well, Patrick, so what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, I don't know. He's like, do you have a scooter? I'm like, no, I don't. Um, but do you want to come exploring with me? And I would actually believe, like in my memory, and maybe my memory is wrong, but I actually even managed to make a joke and tell him that I have to check my schedule. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I was I had a really great honor to come back then the first time ever. No, actually not. No, first time I went with other people with the rebuild. But I came to the pit. Uh, with Steve to explore parts, not, not me exploring, of course, him exploring some of the shallow parts of the pit. And back then, uh, the road there was pretty hectic. Uh, only a few people really dared to go there with their trucks. And there was no stairs, so you had to jump in the water and you had to climb back out. Uh, honestly, until today, I'm not 100% sure exactly why he invited me. Maybe the curiosity over this uh, kind of like young guy that just moved here from Europe. Uh, on the other side, I believe most likely he just wanted somebody to help him to pull the tanks out of the water <laughs> at the end of the dive. <laughs> like this, he stayed down in the water. I climbed up and pulled the tanks up. So, you know, it might have been a mix of both. Let's just uh, say that from you know, my ego is going to have an easier time to deal with it. Um, 
the one thing that I remember from these dives was that he swam unbelievably fast and had a hard time keeping up, even though he was lying leg and I just had to swim. So at this time, Steve started with the uh, idea of the razor, but he still used a uh, dive right trans pack, as you can see in the in the video. Also, it's really cool videos, by the way, by Marty O'Farrell on YouTube, if you if you want to have a look at them. And uh, he used the trans pack with the venture wing. And so this was already by itself quite unique because most people use rack wing or track wing. And he specifically chose the venture wing because it had most of the lift on the hip, if you look at a picture of them, they're like triangular shaped. So he realized really a long time ago that the lift should be more around the diver's hips really and taken away from the diver's shoulders. I want to, I'm gonna sidetrack for a split second because I wanna use this opportunity uh, just by the completely ridiculous chance that Steve might be listening. Um, there was this one day when I called Steve up and had a question about how to not uh, exploration line. So in exploring, we have a knot every 10 feet to measure distance. And he said it was too complicated to explain me on the phone and I should come to his house and he would teach me. So I went to his house and he showed me the knotting machine of Bill Phillips. And we st I started knotting line. And during the course of this really long afternoon, Steve has shared with me how to cut trail, how to use the compass uh, surveying program, uh, his regulator configuration. At, at that time, I used to have two 40 inch hoses, one from the left, one from the right, and the second stage was trapped in the bungee on my shoulders, on my, my uh, shoulder D-rings. So, and he was the first person that I saw that had regulators delivering from the left and from the right and two short hoses. And I thought that was such an amazing idea. And he basically shared in, you know, squeezing into or condensing a lot of the information about how to explore a cave with me in this one afternoon. And um, Steve, if you hear this, I'm gonna be forever eternally grateful to you for taking the time and, uh, and teaching me those, those beginnings or put me on my first beginnings as a cave explorer really. And uh, don't worry people, I paid him back. Uh, I knotted that afternoon like 8,000 feet of line for him or something. <laughs> Good. Then in late 2007 uh, was the first time I actually laid eyes on his invention, which was the razor. Uh, when he was teaching a course out of the Shibalba dive shop in Tulum, which was on the main road back then. And so he just pulled it out of the out of the backpack, basically. And there was Robbie, the owner of Shibalba and, and Bill and explained them his version. But I think at this point in time, they were definitely too traditional to really buy into it. Uh, Bill eventually did like a few years later, but I think he was just a little bit too far ahead of the time. Uh, and so most people looked at him a little bit strange. Ultimately what Steve did was, was a bit more like a back to the roots. So at this time, again, we have this quite big rigs uh, with uh, back mount wings sandwiched with harnesses and, and all of these disadvantages from that, as I explained you. So in the late 80s, actually, and 90s, most cave exploration here in Mexico, uh, like Nochna Chich and Dos Ojos, people were already using salmon equipment with uh, mostly self-made harnesses. As you can see in the picture, two of the more like famous ones because they were actually a little bit reproduced. So there's several people that was sporting those harnesses. Like on the left-hand side, you can see the Paul Smith harness. Uh, quite interesting, you can see the black loop in the middle of it. So that was a bicycle inner tube, and that was used instead of the, the nowadays bungee we use to keep the tanks in their place. And on the right-hand side, you see legendary Eric Hutchinson's uh, Simon rig. Uh, I think it's from like 85 or 86 or something. Uh, I had also great pleasure to share a couple of messages uh, thanks, Eric, for sending me the pictures and, and sharing some of your stories from back in the day. It was really amazing. And so they basically already used this concept of having like a, first the harness and then the buoyancy compensator. But as you can see on the right side picture, of course, buoyancy compensators were mainly, uh, you know, recreational BCDs that were kind of like trimmed to place. Stuff that was not used was cut off and, and maybe, let's say, a bit less than ideal, but the best that was there at the time. To get us back to this, you know, 
Floridian versus Flor uh, Floridian versus Mexico, more or less. Like, why why are the, the rigs so different in their view, right? And how they look. Why is one so minimalistic and, and one not? I think you can distill it down to a really important quote from Steve when he said, "On side mount, no mount exploration dives in very restricted cave. Every piece of extra equipment tries to kill you." Now you might think that that sounds a little bit exaggerated, but Truth of the matter is, if you remember this this picture that I that I showed you earlier from this really <clears throat> you know like chemically eroded cave that's like all edgy with the Velcro rock, literally anything that would stick out from you is going to attach to it, and you're just going to drag it with you, creating bad visibility and increasing your anxiety. Specifically, materials. You talk like everybody thinks, or is that like Cordura? And, and Kevlar and all of these super high tense materials are so perfect and unbreakable. <clears throat> However, in many of these Velcro type caves, the more friction the surface has, the more it attaches itself to the cave. And once the diver applies some sort of force to free himself is usually the moment when these materials break, rip or tear. So, uh, to give an idea, I used to use really thin uh, trilaminate dry suits uh, sometimes for exploring also with a really smooth surface, very thin. Everybody think I'm going to make holes in it left, right and center and I never did. And then when I used a Cordura dry suit from Northern Diver, I destroyed it in like a month. So in 2008, I saw Steve in various different versions of the Razor, uh, also including a one inch webbing model that we dubbed uh, the Tanga. So it was basically the, the one inch dive rod webbing, even had dive rod written all over it. So bear that in mind, I have a pretty good story about that too. And he used like triangular shaped uh, D-Rex. He just basically tried to make everything as minimalistic as possible, mainly to make it easy to carry it through the jungle, but also to be like small and streamlined in the water, right? One of the really sort of like interesting days for me was a day in Ponderosa where we met Sam Meacham, uh, maybe the person that really got, not maybe, the person that, the first person to ever talk to me about exploration. I was in 2005 here and they had a INTD event and he had just presented a movie called The Hidden Worlds of the Maya, which he had filmed with, the, I think, BBC and, and Steve. And he spent like an hour of his life explaining me the ins and outs of, more than that, the ins and outs of how to become a cave explorer. So always in debt for that as well. So as you can see, I was really very lucky throughout my career to sort of like meet the right people at the, at the right time. So Sam, I, I don't want to say that he had started with his GE training at the time because I don't really recall. What I do recall is him coming back in double tanks, uh, two stages, and uh, the back then revolutionary uh, Suex Soexo DPV with lead acid battery still. And so you would see him and right next to him, you would see Steve in a wetsuit and the razor harness. And you'd be like, they're gonna go like do some similar activity. Yet one looks like he's gonna go to the moon and the other guy looks like he's basically naked. Uh, something that was truly unique though about Steve also, we have to say at that time, uh, I don't know a lot of people that were muscularly that dense that they would jump in the water with a barely used seven mil body glove wetsuit with no weight, exhale, and then just sink. <clears throat> so once he had the idea and the concept finished, he also started to sell uh, razor harnesses. And I remember perfect, like the plastic bag with all the bits and pieces and how he shipped them around the world. And we were all both surprised on how successful it was because obviously side mounting was not a very big sport at the time, uh, but also super stoked for him. So a little known fact, at the time, the razor uh, metal parts were produced actually in Playa del Carmen by a metal worker in a Hedo, I believe. And so that was the mini backplate and the delta plate. But of course, it wasn't degraded. So it would basically shred through harnesses and or people had used it a lot, let's put it like that, like after a couple of months. And the rest of the material, like the webbing, the D-rings, the, the buckles, the triglides, the bungee, etc., actually was all imported from Protec and bought from dive rights. Uh, I think that's a quite funny, uh, I, funny information that 
like all of the first races were actually sort of produced by by Dive Ride. So that's a bit of a funny side story. So I used to just order that stuff in bulk for him. Uh, I was an employee at, Pro at Protec at the time. <clears throat> and then we would spend hours and hours and hours counting through hundreds of triglides and hundreds of D-rings. So that was a, a very fond memory of that. Something, or like, a, and as Steve says in the quote, right, a, a true eureka moment. And, and this really from all the cyber history is that really amazing, this one thing that inspired me maybe from a sideband perspective the most was his idea of using a hydration bag as a buoyancy compensator. So he had realized that he could dive, you know, based on his body, right? Uh, quite negative, like he didn't need weight. So he wouldn't have the problem of a compressing wetsuit and then having to deal with being too overweight. He could do that just with lung volume change. But he also realized that once he would put a stage on, then it would bring him to his limits, right? So he thought this little bit of extra buoyancy of like a two liter hydration bag would help him to overcome this. So then was his first idea of using an hydration bag. And the first time I saw that, I thought it's so cool how this is solving so many problems in one go. First of all, they're getting dressed. You put the harness first and you put the wing after. So no chance of having the wing folded or any trouble. Second, it would move the lift exactly where you need it, around your hips, sorry, around your lower back. So exactly where the center of gravity of a Simon diver is. Third, it was so small. Not only were your shoulders free, but once deflated, it basically just curled into that curve of your lower back and basically vanished. Seeing him back then with that equipment underwater was like tripping, right? I was just uh, starting doing some deep exploration in the pit. So most of my dives were with the rebreather and like, you know, 10 bailout tanks and two scooters and seeing somebody enjoying the cave diving aspect, but with in such a minimalistic way without all the hassle was like, it was truly inspirational. So in 2008, uh, I started then teaching side mounting myself. And obviously because there was no real, I mean, there was the transpec and everything, we sold it also, but for most people, it was way out of league as far as, you know, buying one went. Even worse than that, you know, I don't remember how much Steve charged back then for a raise in the, in the plastic bag. I, it might've been $250, it might've been 180, 200, somewhere in that range, I don't really remember, but no matter. For most people that I taught back then, which were local uh, recreational diving instructors and, and local divers, we, nobody had even remotely, I mean, the average salary was like six, $700. So it was completely unthinkable. So back then we basically recreated it just out of webbing and went to uh, a shoemaker on Constituentes and just had the webbing stitched together, which of course made it like there's only one webbing per person. Like if somebody would be different in size, wouldn't work, right? And as a joke back then, uh, I called it the laser. And you know, back then things were still very relaxed and we actually had the chance to talk about those things before everything exploded and things became more serious. Uh, then in early 2009, I assisted Steve uh, on the first ever uh, course where the razor was used as a harness. You see that the picture on the right, uh, my really, really, dear friend Hans was a student. But as you can imagine, it was really not quite optional at that time at the very beginning to ask students to do this type of diving with an hydration bag as a buoyancy compensator that they would have to orally inflate. So it went a little bit more back again towards how the Paul Smith harness and the Eric, and Eric Hutchinson's harness was with you know the razors like the base and then a recreational BCD on top, which was quite funny because back then I remember for Tristan and for Hans and, and for Kate and some of the other people, we would have to, you know, go all over Pilot Carmen and find, uh, like I remember Dive Mike, I for sure bought like two or three BCDs back then from Dive Mike. We would take the plastic shell that you would strap the tank to, we take that out, cut all the pockets off and spend like an entire day with the soldering iron, duct tape, zip ties and scissors to turn it into usable salmon equipment. Um, during the class with Steve, 
uh, I changed my side mounting style. He's the, Steve, my hero, right? I want to look exactly like he does. So I changed my continuous, I changed my bungee loops to continuous bungee, which didn't quite. So if you think about the difference, so before I would have my, my clips on the cylinders about one third from the floor, even half of the tank that would bring the valves down into my armpits. And then I would use a bungee to locate them there. Steve's approach at the time was a bit different. It was like, bring the clip, the attachment point low on the cylinder, attach it to a hip. And then the weight of the first stitch in the valve would just throw the tanks to the front and they would just be kept or held in place by the continuous bungee. Now that ended for my, I'm pretty short. So that ended for me in having them more like front mounted. So I had like always to keep my arms open, which just the tanks was okay. But then once I added stages, it became really crowded in front of me. And I was a tiny person, like tiny, tiny, tiny person. The other thing is for me going to small cave, I really didn't like to drag the tanks through the muck. I always wanted to have my chest as the lowest point of my configuration. So, because it's much easier for me to measure when I look at the restriction, I have a very good awareness for my tanks. Yes but I have even better awareness for where my chest is, right? Because I live with it for my entire life. So I kind of wanted to do it, but it also frustrated me quite in a couple of things. So, uh, but I gave it a try anyways. Um, in an attempt to make my body longer, I used D-rings, you're gonna, you're gonna see a picture later. I used D-rings that were used from uh, rebreeders back then. So many rebreeders back then, like the Inspiration and the Megadon had over the shoulder counter lungs. And so we, they designed D-rings that would be sticking out on the side. So I could use those D-rings, attach them to the bottom of my harness, and that would make me a little bit taller, so to speak. Now, one of, some of you will ask, why did you not use a, a butt plate? Right? The butt plates would, would have made you longer. That's true. I would have moved the attachment point way lower. However, one of the problems is right, our aluminum tanks, they get buoyant as we use them. So at some point I would have had to unclip them from the butt plate and clip them to a point more in the front, which now of course my waist strap is much higher than like much higher than my than the butt plate and then the clip would be in the wrong position. As some other problems arose. Uh, in the same time, you have to understand that there was only one course as far as side mounting went, and it was side mount and no mount cave diver, and it was supposed to be two days. So. Just fathom this. You would take a cave diver that has never used side mount in his entire life. And on his first course within two days, you would pass side mount restrictions. That was the, that was standard. That was the norm back then. That was the default. Uh, however, Steve thought that that was more uh, suicidal in approach, uh, maybe in like a uh, Darwin standards and made the decision to split the course up into like basic side mount to just get the people, people comfortable in the rig and then do like cave training with them afterwards. And many of us discussed if that was uh, a good approach or not, because again, where we came from, people that wanted to go side mounting were really experienced, uh, really, really experienced cave divers that now wanted to go into solo cave diving with redundancy or exploration or small cave. Hence, we thought that they would be faster able to adapt to new equipment. The other really controversial part was Steve suddenly for these courses switched away from the two short hoses to a long hose on the right. And I have to admit, uh, I was maybe among the people that talked most shit about that <laughs> because, well, I was too small minded, too short sighted. I didn't really understand that, you know, where side mount was about to go. Uh, more into a team diving um, environment where people would have to maybe dive in mixed teams where somebody else would depend on that long hose and would also increase the capability of a team to share the gas amongst each other to make the rule of thirds or fourth, whatever it is, more uh, conservative by not only having your own gas to make it back to the surface, but also you could use some of the gas of another diver. So this was all very controversial. And, and in this time, I sort of like, contemplated if I wanted to go in the same direction or not. So my personal, then let's call it the evolution. So that my, my transition era was of course now by this time, all of you realize Steve's my ultimate hero. 
And the question, of course, arose like, why would you not use the razor and tap it? Well, it had several reasons. First of all, I was physically very different, very, very skinny. And even back then, when the vast majority of people dove wetsuits, I mean, maybe, I mean, besides the GE guys, maybe everybody was diving wetsuits. But for teaching and guiding, that was not optional, uh, optional for me because within 10 minutes, I would have been frozen to death. Hence, I used a dry suit for teaching and guiding. And then when it came to hiking through the jungle and exploring, I would use a wetsuit. Hence, I needed a harness where I could add and subtract weight rather quickly and a quite large amount of weight because I used very, a lot, a lot of undergarment. So if you look at my heavily modified trans pack on the left and the red circle at the bottom, you can see the holes that are made with a soldering iron to be able to zip tie weight to the harness. So if I was in a dry suit, I would mount uh, 16 pounds to that uh, lower back area. And if I was in a wetsuit, I would mount two pounds to my shoulder area, just exactly for the reason that I explained to you before. Uh, funny in that picture also, as you can see that uh, D-ring that came from the Megalodon rebreather, and you can see my first ever sliding D-ring design. So this was one reason, right? I, from, a, from a dry suit diving point of view, the razor just was not really ideal for me. The other thing was the whole, I, I didn't want to put the recreational BCD on, like hell no. And the whole hydration bag thing with the oral inflation, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I did not possess the skill to come down a slope while laying line and switching regulators and orally inflating my PC. I was not good enough as a diver to do that. Hence, I was very reluctant. Besides that, different mentality, right? I own the Transpac. And back then, the value of this Transpac was crazy amount to me. So the idea of not using it anymore was inconceivable. But I own this really amazing piece of kit, but just out of conviction, I'm not going to use it. So Basically, we just try to push like uh, a square peg through a round hole type situation. So as you can see, there was quite a, a lot of modification on my trans pack. I made it continuous webbing without buckles, uh, made heaps of holes in it with a soldering iron, took all of the cushing off, uh, tried to make it as minimalistic in its approach as possible. Uh, I also back then returned to the bungee loop system because the whole, uh, for me personally, having the tanks too high up and too minor front, far in the front wasn't really working for me. And so this was then my, my rig at the time. From my personal growth and, and history, a uh, really very important moment was when in 2009, uh, a group of Polish divers came to Protec, led by a Polish diver called Leszek. Uh, who at the time I reckon was one of the richest people in Poland actually. And he carried with him a quite vast entourage of people. Uh, and they were coming to do like a distance record in scootering in, in the Sokos cave system. And I was the safety officer of this, or like I facilitated the logistics of it. Uh, this was also the first time I met Krzysztof Stanowski. Uh, I found this picture. This picture is actually years after we met, but still quite a long time ago. As you see, both of us look very young. Uh, and this was when we met each other in France. So this is really cool because back then Chris didn't side mounts, didn't dive rebreathers. So one of the real amazing things for me about my, my, my job and, and the, the business that I'm in is also to see people like him uh, or their evolution from the guy that used to sleep in the bus in front of mom's hotel to now absolutely world record breaking legendary up. Uh, uh, deep diving, cave exploring legend, right? So, uh, great pleasure for me to to see the success of, of those people also. So basically, during a surface, not a surface interval, like actually me and Richard. So one of the entourage of this group was Richard, the owner of a Polish dry suit company called Equus. Uh, we would be hanging out on the surface, waiting for the rest of the group to come back, and and then he started to ask me because I was diving side mount at the time. He started to ask me about, you know, hey, but what is this equipment that you use exactly and, and, and how do you use it? And he was really quite interesting because he seemed to already understand somewhat of the potential of side mounting. And, and I remember hanging out with him for hours with a piece of paper and then drawing uh, basically a transpec with a weight pocket and then 
just uh, you know a, a hydration bag that was you know with a dump valve and the corrugated hose. If you want to simplify it, we also talked about different attachment points. I think back then we had like this special type of Velcro how we wanted to wrap the ring around, which would have for sure not worked. And but anyways, it was quite interesting. So it was the first time for me as a person to like work with the manufacturer and and draw up some ideas. And as you can see in that email in like early 2010. Uh, one of that group flew back over to Mexico and delivered me the first prototype of this idea. And, you know, being whatever, like 27 years old at the time, having something that was just in your mind. And then the first time you physically hold it, it was an outrageously trippy feeling. <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, I could not even imagine that somebody would have taken me or my idea is serious enough to actually do something like that. So that was really cool. And you can see basically the transition then in the two pictures. So left you have my transpack and then right you have this first version of the Equus harness. Uh, you can see basically where the ideas came from. It's very similar shape, had the weight pockets to it with a zipper left and right, however, because I thought that that was truly missing on the sidemount market was to have a rig that would have enough place for weight. Floridian rigs didn't really need that because most people there dive with steel tanks. Mexican rigs definitely need it because dry suit and aluminum tanks needs quite a lot of weight. In the same time, you can also see still the dive right buckle on it. So you realize that all the Aquas didn't have access to any of the hardware. So we had to still put that from, from dive right. And you see my first version of the, of the primary light holder on the crotch strap also. I didn't even remember that until I found this picture. So basically you can imagine how many soldering irons I broke in my life, making all of these holes in different parts of webbings. Uh, now a more difficult time starts. Inspired by Steve, uh, another group of local divers invented, uh, Santiago Pintado and, and Etienne Rousseau, invented uh, a new type of harness, which was called the ultimate harness. Some changes to it, as in the shoulder straps were independent, for example, from the waist strap, which made it adjusting a bit easier and faster without changing the length of the waist strap. Uh, and the parts to it, you didn't have to get specially manufactured parts. It was a triangle in the square that was super easy available. And it was like a cheaper option for most of the local people that simply didn't have the money to do anything else. So it caught quite a lot of momentum from the very, very beginning for the local people, because it was a very affordable uh, yet functional uh, harness. But I have to admit back then, like basically a little bit the rumble in the jungle started with uh, accusations one against the other and a little bit of jealousy left out in the center. Um, but still at that point, there was no wing on the market. So still people ended up with this really dope looking harness and then a stupid recreational BCD on top of it, which, which was hiding the cool looking harness. So uh, that question was answered then by UTD. Um, now I reached out to Andrew Jujitis on Facebook and I asked him several times to provide some information just to make this more accurate. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So I'm just gonna call it 2011-ish. You know, it might have been 2010, I don't know, but in my gut feeling says it's more like 2011. That wing came out. Uh, like a triangular shaped wing, as you can see in the right down corner, left up. And with it, a lot of rumors started. So UTD had just started to be an organization a couple of years before that. Uh, back then, all of us got like this invitation email along the line of, you know, we chose you, you're like the top instructor of your area. Everybody felt really amazing until you realized that each one of your friends received the same email. And basically, long story short, um, some of, you know, the the, Steve's group or Steve's disciples or some of his trainees basically switched over to UTD and only a few months later that that UTD C trim came to life, which obviously the harness reassembled one to one um, a razor harness and the wing seemed to be enough. No proof, no nothing for it. That's, that's why I call it rumors. It seemed like an, an early prototype of Steve. So I would call this as like the igniting moment a little bit for almost a little bit, I would say the situation that we have today where it seems that people fighting with each other for no reason over what type of equipment they use to go diving. Uh, anyways, um, so this was a little bit the story there. So suddenly this UTD wing 
was already available here in Mexico. Plus we had like a French guy that sold it for $99. So basically this was the solution for everybody. Everybody that used the laser, razor or, or ultimate harness, everybody used this triangle shaped UTD wing. However, it became evident after quite a short period of time that for men in wetsuits, it was really not an ideal situ uh, solution because as the wing stopped above your butt, the buoyancy compensator didn't really reach far enough down, which made it almost impossible for people, even just with two tanks in a wetsuit, to stay horizontal because the legs were too negative. Uh, and then people did everything they could, right? Everybody switched to Maris Avanti Quattro fins because they were lighter, uh, tried to keep the weight on a short. I mean, everybody tried to make it work, but specifically once they would shoot uh, videos or pictures and needed extra weight on the butt or like a, an expiration reel, suddenly everybody would be like vertical in the water, which was really less than ideal. Due to going vertical or like, let's say diagonal in the water, gas would also constantly migrate to that upper third, this upper triangle in the wing, which would cause even more trim issues, as you can imagine, as well as the wear and tear. This is, of course, not for your general public, but people like Mauro Bordignon that was known to push extremely small cave uh, was annihilating that wing within like one or two months. The top was only aqua seal because it basically started to protrude from in between the shoulder blades and then got annihilated on the cave ceiling. So there were some drawbacks and people kind of like felt it doesn't really work. Uh, yet it's quite funny. I think from all of the things that then were reproduced in a million different versions by so many different manufacturers was all this like triangle shaped wing. And at some point people thought that side mount wings should look like that. But I guess we've proven by now that it's maybe not the most ideal shape. In the same time, I have to admit, I lost a little bit the, the race there, which was starting to really, really frustrating. So, as you see now, the actual idea of you know turning a hydration bag into a wing, uh, into a proper wing, was there quite before the whole UTD wing and everything. So, and I would lie if I would not tell you that. Of course, the thought was to build a wing also that would be able to be used by racer people and, and everybody else. Honestly, I have to admit, you know, maybe there was a small, maybe not maybe there was a part of me that dreamed of combining maybe a wing that I designed with, with Steve's razor harness. And then, you know, this would be like something like the student and the ornamental and the student, but ultimately that didn't really work out. But in any way, shape or form, back then the rig was called actually the predator harness, believe it or not. Uh, unfortunately, even before we released it, um, I see rebreeders brought out the predator rebreather. And then I, at some point also she would have brought out a computer so we had to abandon this idea and switch to the name Stealth. Uh, not 1.0, by the way, it was just called Stealth. Um, and it was even in one Polish magazine when it came out, it was called like that. And ultimately when I had to follow it with Equus and I left them, the Stealth 2.0 was a little bit of a, you took my idea, you took my name, I'm gonna go one step above after it. It was a very, very petty move, yet I'm very happy about the name. Uh, and so basically when I got the equipment, I spent a considerable amount of time in wetsuit, dry suit. Um, as you can see, there's like a list on the left hand side. I did a lot of testing with it and I wrote like a six, seven page uh, report on the things that should be changed because I thought we we're really going the right direction, but it is somewhat a little bit wrongly implemented. And so I offered some solutions to it, which some of them were adopted in the next version and some of them weren't, but already the relationship started to be quite stale. It, Took a very long time for emails to get sent back forwards. Uh, then eventually a Polish group came with uh, uh, Chris and then he already had the new version, but they didn't have one for me. So I had to wait for them to be done diving for them to receive the harness. I didn't, you know, I didn't feel the love, let's say like that. And, and also like from a lot of the ideas that I gave them that were really good, they were not done. So I started to be a bit frustrated about that too. Nonetheless, we still had a relationship at the time and I ordered the first 10 or was it 15? I don't remember of these uh, stealth Equus stealth harnesses. As you can see, we were even important enough to have our own logo on it. But yet there was many things that were just not not addressed by that 
last or next version of harness. So first of all, I already mentioned in my report that the location of the dump valve was less than ideal. Having it very far on one side. So the main idea of a dump valve, right, is first of all, it's a pretty big hole in your buoyancy compensator. So you sort of want to have it in a place that if it fails, you don't lose all the gas, right? So you don't want to have it at like a high point of your body or any place where if it would get stuck open, which ha happens to us a lot because of sediment and percolation, or if this, the spring would fail. Um, some 10 years ago, uh, all of these dump valves had a massive uh, impure stainless steel in the spring. So Halcyon, Dive, and everybody had to do a massive recall. So we, we didn't want to have a dump valve that if it would break, he would suddenly have to swim out like, you know, head down, feet up or sideways. So from this point of view, the, the dump valve was in a good location because even if it would fail, it would still be sort of okay. But you also had to constantly roll to dump gas. And, and I wasn't really a big fan of that. And that you could only use it with one hand and not with two hands, considering serviceability or scootering, I thought also to be less than ideal. Besides, as you've as I've just explained before, the trim problems for guys were still the same as the points and compensators simply didn't reach far enough down. So everybody still had to use very light fins, uh, couldn't use big battery canisters on the button. It was quite limiting from that point of view. Once the wing was inflated, it was also a complete disaster. It looked like a camel hump on your back. So th that also looked really horrible and did some changes to the shape of it, but didn't really like it at all. Uh, the loop bungee mounting on the top was way too high. Uh, there was just many, many, many things that were not really working the way I wanted to. The, all of the painting kit or the, 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 the labeling came off and they didn't have no hardware, no dump valves no corrugated hoses, no inflators, no D-rings, no nothing. So I still had to buy all of that from Dive Right again. I wonder why they never wondered <laughs> or asked why I bought so many of these pieces. But I basically then had to assemble the, the rig myself. So also that was really far from, from ideal. Uh, it all ended up with the final fiasco where communication became worse and worse and worse and worse. I didn't hear from them in a long time. And, and then I, I guess I had different things to do. And when I then came to Europe, that was the, the last drop in the bucket. I came to Europe to teach a couple of courses and they had shipped me five or six units straight to my address in Austria. And basically, as you can see in the picture, the opening cut of the, of the wing was actually for a dry suit valve and not for a dump valve. So I basically, you know, I had to cancel all my courses and all of this was a disaster and I just, decided to drop the hat on it. Uh, ultimately, I believe that most of my gray hair comes from that. <laughs> so in the same time, there was one of my students that was supposed to pick up the wing was a Polish guy named Arthur. And he told me, hey, listen, I have this friend of mine who just started uh, to produce wings and back plates in Poland. Maybe he can help you. And believe it or not, that person was Piotr from Axdeep. And I remember one of the first questions he had for me was, Patrick, what do you think about our, our company name, XDeep? And I think I answered, I think triple XDeep would be better because your web page would get much more clicks if they think it's porn. Uh, however, we started to communicate. And to be perfectly honest with you, um, I was not really fond. I just went through like two or three years of nonstop fighting, losing reputation, losing money, uh, constantly waiting for a solution that never happened. So I was really over it. And I thought, yes, you know, making more equipment with a Polish manufacturer is exactly what I want in my life. So, but Piotr really didn't, didn't stop communicating to me. And, and then eventually I told him the, the only way that I would do this, if there was like contracts in place, right. That would protect my intellectual interest, uh, as Aquas, the first thing, when I told him that I'm going to stop collaborating with them and that I would wish for, for Kristanowski to take the project over. One of the first answers I got was like, yeah, by the way, everything is patented in Europe and, and States. And if you want to use it, we're going to sue you type thing. So, so I really thought, dude, if I do this again, there have to be contracts in place that also protect me. Right. And, and so that was really different with Piotr. Like I told him, listen, I only want to do this with contracts. And he literally said, where are you? And I told him, well, I'm in Aix-en-Provence close to Marseille. I just come back from cave diving trip to France. And he was like, well, I'll see you tomorrow. And that's exactly how it was. 
we were supposed to meet, meet and greet and sign some contracts. And it ended in a seven hour design frenzy. One of the things that I realized from the beginning was this guy didn't even dive Simon. Yet his understanding and point of view of manufacturing problem solution and design was so way beyond anything I could do. But I could give all of the input of this is what I feel as a diver underwater. This is what I would like my equipment to feel like, or, or this is what I want my equipment to do. But I did not know how to necessarily make this a reality, right? I'm like a tinker. I can burn holes with soldering irons like the world champion. But then like to have like a 3D model in my head of like a metal piece, my, my mind doesn't do that. I'm not intelligent enough for that. So working with him was completely mind blowing, right? I was yeah, starstruck almost. And, and ultimately, so we start to develop the equipment, which also was a bumpy road, right? At some point, uh, Piotr listened a little bit too much to other people in that area. And we did have a quite, quite hefty fight sometimes. Uh, but it's funny because even when we started to use the equipment, it was still in design somewhat. So like I would receive four or five prototypes and would teach classes on it. And one of the really funny courses I remember was with Lee Cunningham. Uh, Lee Cunningham, obviously legendary deep diver from the old days in Egypt, broken, I don't know how many records and really, really absolutely amazing, fun person to hang out with. And so he came with a group and we did a sideman course and I'm not going to lie. It looked absolutely horrendous. Yeah, it was like somebody had a diaper on that was full and floating in the, I, I was so ashamed. I didn't even want to be seen with this. So I can tell you it was a long way until our equipment finally had this like ninja minimalistic special ops look. <laughs> it was really not a, not something that happened overnight. But yeah, I definitely remember this time of like, man, this is embarrassing. I, I don't want this to bear my name, but obviously how it turned out at the end. So on the picture below on the right hand side, you see like one of the really, really early prototypes of the Stealth 2.0 wing, which ultimately, of course, then we realized we need to get the lift down. Well, we need to shape the bladder different. So, but this was one of the first prototypes we had, which I think I then gifted to Audrey Cudell or at some point, and or I don't know, at least I don't know any longer where it is. Good, and then finally, uh, the my X-Deep Stealth 2.0 era started. And one thing I guess that I'm, I'm very proud about, which obviously had nothing to do with me, but is that the Stealth 2.0 was actually the first Sideman equipment that had CE approvement. Uh, and that was in March, 2012. So that was of course a really big step for us in regards to you know, selling it in Europe. We really, th I think basically we had a pretty good success in the one size fits all concept. Um, you can see here, Duncan and Trendy, uh, very, very different sized people and it worked fairly good. Uh, we made the decision also obviously very from the beginning to separate all of the different harnesses simply to make adjustment faster because the idea of, you know, if you want to make the cross strap shorter, the, the spinal strap gets shorter, or you want to make the shoulder strap shorter, then the waist strip gets longer. I did not want to have these webbings connected with each other. Once we made that decision, it became quite evident that we should also use different strength of webbing, right? Really stiff webbing on the shoulders can be strenuous, can also cut into your neck seal. Uh, you want to have really stiff webbing on your waist though, because that's where the tanks are attached to. And obviously crotch strap uh, is notoriously breaking dry suits and makes men and women alike feel uncomfortable all over the world. So the idea of making that really soft then was just basically naturally came with the decision to use uh, different webbings for, for the, the harness. And nowadays people use different colors and quite impressed sometimes on how all of the different things people come up with and how they configure it. And of course the weight system. Now I was very fond of my weight system with Aquas to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, the zipper and the compartments worked really well, but this was just one of the things where the risk of like uh, uh, a copyright infringement was too high. And so we decided to go with Velcro, which ultimately worked out super, super nicely as well. Uh, it just gives 
the like having a, a, a weight system that cannot only use lead weight just makes it so more flexible in case of traveling, right? Like I remember the first time I came to France uh, and they didn't have weight blocks, right? Because they're having steel tank doubles there. And I went to like a sports shop and bought like the jogging weight that people strap around their ankles and wrists and used that. Uh, one time in Madagascar, I used rocks also uh, because we lost a piece of weight in, trans in transit. So it gives you a lot of, a lot of possibilities. In the same time, so all of the things that I hope I explained you over the last uh, one hour and 10 minutes, oh my God, I'm sorry for wasting so much of your time. When I talk about diving, I start to babble a little bit. So, but what I think, I hope I could show you over the last one hour and 10 minutes is also one of the reasons why having those shoulders free, the shoulder blades free was so important from my previous experience. So having that uh, worked really well. And then obviously teeing off at that idea of moving the buoyancy compensator really where it's supposed to be in your lower back where your center of gravity is and and then making it so nice and streamlined yet with such a lot of lift now one of the things that is so funny right and it's like a proof for your success here in mexico we really don't have like this big guru type diving instructors where everybody just looks exactly like that guy and nobody ever questions what they do Right, like he dives like this, must be working then. He's the most badass. Let's do all exactly the same thing. Here in Mexico, it's like the opposite. Everybody wants to be different. No, no, never nobody wants to do what you do. So if you manage to convince some of your friends to use equipment that you designed or a procedure or a protocol, you can consider yourself a very, very lucky person. So, so Steve managed to do that with the razor step by step. And, and I was lucky enough to manage to do that with my circle of friends to step by step, have them convinced to use this equipment. I remember specifically, I, I, I walked with Mauro to a cave called Axolom and he was like, nah, but you know, your, your stealth wing looks so massive, but once it's on you, it's actually pretty cool. Can I try it? Uh, another really funny story was uh, Philip Lehman. So Philip Lehman dove the razor, of course. And, and he's a little bit hard to, once he likes something or he has a rhythm, it's quite hard to convince him otherwise. And uh, I remember he tried it on and he was like, nah, but it's too tight. I don't like it. So I'm like, okay. And then there was like this, this number riddle game on Facebook. And he was like, you know, I cracked the riddle. And I was sure he did. I mean, you know, he's the type of guy that finds out how riddles work. And I'm like, well, I don't think so. But if you really did, I'm gonna give you a stealth for free as a price. He still does not believe me that I already knew and that I just used this to give him a stealth. But anyways, that is the story I, li I don't like, trust me. So ultimately, of course, he had the riddle figured out. He got the stealth. And I remember the first phone call when he was there with his sister doing a cavern tour. He came out of the water, he called me right away and he was like, dude, this is the best shit ever. Uh, it feels like the tanks are velcroed to my thighs. That's exactly what he said. And, and over the course of the next two years, three years, I would get random phone calls from him from the Dominican Republic or somewhere. And he was like, dude, dude, this is like the best harness. Or, or he would then, you know, uh, give it to a, an exploration partner from him in the DR and adjust it. And then he was like, wow, I'm not a cyber instructor, but even for me, it's easy to make people look good in it. So that, that I think is the biggest triumph, right? If you manage to get people that are really criticizing your style or what you do and you get them to swing your way. So that was really special to me. Um, so from the wing, we made it definitely long enough to to fix all those problems, right? We made it long enough to have the head to tow trim possibilities. So you could, even in wetsuit with heavier fins, you could use it. Uh, the central dump valve, which was the most controversial uh, thing that we did back then. Like everybody was like, no, you can't reach that. Uh, no, this is dangerous, blah, 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 blah. And it's funny how so many manufacturers now ended up uh, using that same idea. <clears throat> And, and I can tell you, generally, for most people that have trouble reaching it, it's usually a configuration issue, right? If you think about it, it's right on top of your butt. So if you can reach your butt, then usually it's not a problem. Unless, you know, from an adjustment point of view, your wing is too loose and the, the wing goes away from your butt and it goes too high up. And sometimes uh, have people have problems to reach it. But of course, this is a configuration issue. 
And many people forget also that just because you have a dump valve does not mean you can't use the corrugated hose in a power inflator. The only thing you have to do is go a little bit more vertical to get the gas moving up into the corrugated hose, and you can also deflate from the power inflator. And of course, one thing that I really liked, and besides, I liked working with Piotr, but one thing that I clearly saw, I'm not going to say the manufacturer, but back then we had a manufacturer that used to produce their wings and stuff in Mexico City, actually. So we had wings from like the late 80s and they looked perfect. And once they started to move production to, to Asia, uh, if, you know, our rental wings would be like, everything would be frayed out and the, dump, the, the stitching around the dump valve would come undone within months. So the, the loss of quality was crazy. So for me to know that the materials were, you know, from the States and from Europe and, and that the manufacturing was to be done also in Europe made me very confident about the quality of the equipment. And obviously uh, time has shown that we were proven right. Uh, the, the durability of the equipment is literally insane considering how much wear and tear we produce on it, uh, being diving instructors here in Mexico going diving every day. Good, hang, hang in there people, we're, we're almost done. <laughs> Good. So with that new equipment, um, there was also a change in philosophy. So side mounting until that point for me was very much exploring, solo diving, uh, uh, you know, being on your own, just having to worry about yourself territory. But in the same time, in my regular diving, I was always very team oriented. I'm, I'm trying to be careful with using the term DIR because it has so much negativity attached to it. But let's just call it very standardized. Like I, I like to have very standardized equipment configuration between my team also, which was totally against, back then, totally against the Sidemon principle that was made out and sold to be a true unique style of diving. So what did that mean? I tried to keep my side mounting as similar to my back mounting and to my rebreather diving, which means I would have my light in my light, my light in my left hand. I would have a long hose from the right, short hose from the from the left tank, and and would make everything seem to look and feel as similar. That would help me as a diver, as I didn't have to change my my habits. Right, my muscle memory would stay the same, as well as diving in a mixed team with people that didn't have experience with side mount. It was quite easy for them to adapt to me based on me almost looking like, like they do. So that was really important. Something that in protect training we emphasize a lot is team diving. And that as a team member, you're really only one of two things. You're either an asset to the team or you're a liability to the team. And there's really nothing in between. What do I mean by that? If you do not actively contribute safety to my dive, then you, by merely being there, are going to be a liability to my life. If you do not look at me constantly, scanning me, telling me, hey, mate, your spool is sticking out of your pocket. Uh, your backup light is switched on. Your uh, long hose came undone. Your light cord is out. If you not constantly give me that input, right, then by you merely being there, you don't contribute to my safety. But if something happens to you now, I'm going to have to deal with you. So how to become an asset is I have to pay a lot of attention to my team members. Now, it's funny how people often tell me, oh, Patrick, I'm a solo cave diver. And the only thing I think is, well, that's easy. Right? Everybody can do something complicated while they only have to worry about themselves. Once you have to not only worry about yourself, but also about the other person, then it becomes much more complicated, much more task loading. Right? And you don't take care about the other person because you think they are not capable to. You take care about the other person as self-preservation because people make mistakes. We all make mistakes. So if they make a mistake, you will have to suffer the consequences of their mistake because you're one team. Hence, I need to look at you, scan you, look at your body language, your equipment, if everything is where it's supposed to be and so forth. And the helmet just seems to make that more complicated. Of course, people have you know, uh, helmet mounts where they can put and remove the light. And, and usually when I dive within a team and people want to use a helmet, I have no problem. If you look at videos that I produce, you see that I constantly dive with people with helmets. But I usually have a very simple rule. But the third time you put your light in my face, I call a dive. Because, I, you know, stop blinding me. 
And usually what happens is, you know, no matter how skilled you are, if you are task loaded, you just do a tie off, I give in an attention signal, you're going to look at me and you're going to blind me. Hence, for my type of diving, besides exploring, for my type of diving, we made the decision to go in a more traditional diving way, so with no helmet and, and the light in the left, long hose, short hose, keep everything as similar as possible. In the same time, we realized something very important about aluminum tanks. We realized that to, in order to avoid aluminum tanks from having too much uh, freedom of movement and then kind of like dangle around on you, we would create torque onto the tank. So we would use a short bungee loop that would by its nature rotate the cylinder in one direction while the clip mounted to the tank that attaches it to your hip would not allow that rotation from happening. So now we create a lot of torque and that's that the tanks being velcroed to my thighs principle that Philip mentioned is I can go upside down, sideways, whatever. I never have to worry what my tank will do because it's literally almost attached to my thighs. So all of that changed our philosophy, how we saw Simon diving and ultimately ended up also in a core structure where we would guide people step by step into this new configuration. In the same time, for me, this was like the start of, let's say a bit my traveling career. Uh, I was absolutely lucky enough to, to get invitations from people to join projects, uh, were on funded projects by universities as well as get the chance to teach uh, outside of Mexico, around the world, people that would invite me to teach them uh, in their location. And that brought great possibility in the same time, great fear, right? Because at some point I have to live up to that perception that people have of my skill or my ability. Yet, you know, when was the last time I was wearing dry gloves? When was the last time I was wearing, you know, 450 grams undergarment? So there was a lot of stress involved also to go outside of my comfort zone and then go there, but still look the part, right? So this was something that I found so truly, generally awesome about the stealth that, that I could switch from wetsuit to dry suit in a heartbeat. Uh, I, I could go anywhere in the world and not only dive. I could be like, give me two tanks and I can do whatever you want. I can do uh, deep diving, I can do wreck diving, I can do cave diving, you name it. You know, maybe it's not the ideal solution for all, but I can make it work, right? And so I had the chance to test and use the stealth in, in multi-sump uh, projects where we, we go in and out of the water over kilometers inside a mountain. Uh, I used it to deep dives up to 115 meters, which of course even more would be uh, possible. I just never had the chance or well, mostly when I dive that depth, I'd rather go freewheel diving, but uh, even like, pushing a normal in, in Hispaniola, pushing a normal restriction like 65 meters and with, a, with a, literally a rig that I took out of the box that very morning. So uh, that was really awesome. And in the same time, I tried to, test the limits of it. When, when many people back then said, well, you know, the Mexican rigs are just not feasible to be used in Florida with heavy steel tanks. Now, while this is 100% correct, if we talk wetsuit, like I'm not gonna tell you, hey, take a stealth, bring a wetsuit and dive with 95 cubic foot worthing tanks. But in the same time, I've found out that um, with dry suit with sufficient insulation, uh, it was actually no problem using big heavy cylinders even without, uh, well, because I wouldn't have used weight in it, so or, or weight in my in my harness, I would still not consider anything above 85 low pressure to be a nice or good tank for side mounting, because obviously this whole feeling of freedom and liberty in in moving around in the water column is is so nice. So it's I, I kind of feel like I'm tying my feet together. But having the possibility or knowing that it would work is really a great tool. I, I used 300 bar tanks in, in Mallorca, which was the only time when I thought this really was horrible. Uh, I used concave bottom steel tanks, uh, trimix of any variations, which also makes those sliding gearing such a, such a nice tool that you don't really ever have to worry what gas is in your tanks or, or what manufacturer is it, or you can just always move the tank to have it ex precisely exact in the location that you want to. Um, and ultimately, funny enough, uh, not like about a year ago, uh, because the only time when I wouldn't use side mounting is when I would use rebreathers, right? So then I would have to go back to back mounting. And then ultimately one year ago, the, the discovery of a, of a, for me, new rebreather called the, the Kiss Sidewinder basically then made it full circle. And now uh, as we moved in our equipment, we had back then the stealth only with one wing, which was the classic. Then upon request from our Facebook group, 
uh, we created two more wings to attack in the rack, which is very same uh, idea, just different sizes. And it ended up to be maybe the best uh, uh, rig that I've seen so far working with the Sidewinder Rebreather. So sometimes we design perfect equipment even without wanting to. Good. Uh, so this is the last era, the WTF era against all odds. So the first order that I ever made, you can see on your right hand side screen right now in that picture, those were the first 10 stealths that were ever shipped to uh, Mexico. And it's funny because back then I told Piotr, he's like, how many do you want or how many do you need? First of all, I'm broke, right? So I'm like, well, you know, you have to give me that on consignment because I don't have the money to pay you. But if you send me 10, I should be good for a year or two. Little did I know that I think uh, today's count is like more than 400 only, only in Mexico. So uh, it, it was definitely something that, that uh, exceeded all the expectations that we could possibly have. And something that makes it more clear than anything was uh, the Stealth 2.0 Facebook group. So I created that group. You can see that I'm the admin of it. And because of local politics and some beef that I had with people on Facebook, I made the decision back then to leave Facebook. And I was gone for Facebook for a couple of months, actually, which uh, Piotr was not happy, happy about that at all, actually. So I remember I'm again coming back from France and I sit on the airport in Marseille with my friend uh, Frédéric next to me. And she's just scrolling on her Facebook feed and I see the stealth in Siberia in like ice styling. And I'm like, hang on a second, give me your phone. And I see Stealth 2.0 group and like people in Siberia ice diving with it. I'm like, what? I thought that was like a cave diving equipment. And I went to the group itself and I realized, I don't remember, but it, the number of people that were part of the group that was above 1000 was completely and utterly mind numbing. And also what they were discussing with each other, because we realized that maybe 90% of our clients were using the style for recreation diving actually. So that, that was complete. This was the first time when I realized that the, the, this monster that we had created, this amazing, like I wasn't even aware on how successful this was until I saw this, this Facebook group and I was completely and utterly blown away, mostly by seeing how much joy people get out of this equipment and how it rekindled their love for diving and all of these different environments and how they would share the different configurations and some of them I would consider to be really horrible but you know it was their thing was was and as long as it made them happy and, and it felt good uh it was really really very nice for me so I had this great chance and luck to dive in so many different countries in the world from Mexico Florida Bahamas Austria Zanzibar Poland Mallorca and many of these places doing active cave exploration and and I have to tell you that I'm I'm still I'm still trying to find that one place where the stealth can't go, and and so the search continues. But so far, for me as a tool for diving, it, it has completely and utterly changed my my life forever. So where do we go from here? You might ask. Obviously, you can see that as the time progresses, the picture goes better. <laughs> pictures become better. So where do we go from here? We go to better pictures and better video. Um, where do we go from here? For me, obviously, then the next step, as mentioned, was now to move to a Cyborg Rebreather. Now, Cyborg Rebreathers have been around since quite some time, and obviously being somewhat associated to Cyborg. I mean, there was a time when people would walk up to me on a trade show and call me the Cyborg guy, which was really not something that I identified myself with too much at the time. But so anyways, but I, I, I really never thought that I'm going to do something just because it's a trend. Oh, now everybody goes to Simon Rebus, I'm going to go to Simon Rebus. So it was through a series of, of coincidences that I ended up, mostly I have to blame Philip Lehman, who wanted to go rebuild diving because we had so many exploration projects in Hispaniola and Madagascar where he, it was just out of his range in open circuit. So I tried to get him into rebreathers, but he did not want to have to do anything with back-mounted rebreathers. And then we ended up in this body recovery uh, of two unfortunate uh, souls that drowned in a really small, restricted, horrible cave. In, uh, actually, the cave is really nice, but that section was, was pretty gnarly in, in the Dominican Republic. And I was completely outmatched by the task of getting these two bodies out of this really low bedding plane restriction with like heavy percolation, 
and I, I was like out of my league times a hundred and it was really stressful and nerve wracking every time switching regulators, not knowing how much gas I had because visibility was too zero, line was loose, I needed both hands to work on the bodies, it was. So through this and other coincidences, I ended up with the, the KISS Sidewinder rebreather, which honestly, it's like the last dot on the eye that was missing for me to make the, the, the XD stealth just, you know, the piece of equipment for me. Uh, nowadays, I can travel with such a small piece of luggage and anywhere where I can find an oxygen, a hospital with an oxygen tank, I can do the most outrageous type of diving and exploration. Uh, due to the Sidewinder, we have found, uh, we've added three kilometers to, to Anjanamba Cave in Madagascar past a series of pretty gnarly restrictions that would have been impossible, unconceivable to pass with a Backman rebreather. Uh, we have connected to, uh, and the connection is going to be made known in the next week or so, we've connected um, a fairly big cave system to the second biggest cave system here. Uh, so there's all of these new things that come now from, from this new configuration. And I'm starting to wonder a little bit of like what the limit is, and, and I'm very excited to keep on exploring and evolving as a diver. In the same time, of course, at XDeep, we never stand still. So we've picked up other projects, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, for sure, one of the highlights or big things that we were working on tirelessly over the last years is the, is the regulator line with a truly unique uh, design for the first stage, uh, unlimited possibility to configure it for different configurations with a front mounted turret. Uh, and I think the thing that I'm most excited though, I have to admit at the moment is um, the dry suits that we produce with a company called Seal. And because basically all the stuff that I explained you about like small cave and Velcro rock, uh, this is like the suits to, to do this. So one of the really, I mean, you know, my heart is to explore caves around the world and to have, the, to be able to do this, I'm amazingly grateful. To then also have the possibility to have met all of these key people in my life <clears throat> that now also help me to produce what I consider, right? It's not for everybody, but what, what I consider the perfect equipment for these environments that make my life as a cave diver, as a cave explorer, not only safer, but makes the exploration so much more efficient. Uh, it, it's truly, I mean, it, it just never gets, it's constantly evolving, it never gets boring and it's uh, really, really cool. And uh, I can't wait to show you all the new stuff that is coming that we're working on. Um, but yeah, as always, you have to be a bit patient for that. Good, I guess, woof. I have a dry mouth now, one and a half hours. This is already the end, already. <laughs> I guess half of you fell asleep already half an hour ago. <clears throat> uh, anyways, I want to round this up with uh, a big, 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 big thank you to all of the people that help us. Uh, I mean, I know the entire world is in that same COVID situation, right? We're all tired of staying at home. Uh, many people lost their jobs. Uh, everybody's in an uncertain future and what's gonna happen with travel and with diving and, and, you know, it's a lot of suffering happening around the world. Uh, and and I, I, I would never say that we are the worst off, but of course not. But, um, but yes, the, the situation we are in though, however, means we most likely will not have any work for at least the next month or so, two months, maybe three. And even once work comes back, you can imagine that it's gonna be very, very slow step then. If it should ever go back to how it used to be, it's definitely going to take a long time, which without your support and your donations, we would have not been able to take care about all of these wonderful people that you see in this picture. Uh, at ProTech, I mean, all of you that have been diving with ProTech, you know, we have a family. We, we're not staff, we're not co-workers, we, we are a family and we take care about each other. And we came to a point where we were not capable of taking care about each other no more or about ourselves no more. And we were depending on you guys to help us out and and we're still overwhelmed by by the love that you that you sent us by the, the messages the donations the pre-booked courses like all of the support that we have from you guys uh, it reflects about the team right that they made such an amazing experience for you when you were here that you can't wait to come back and not only to come back to mexico but to see the same faces when you walk through the door of one of our shops so uh thanks again to all of you and um and if you find it possible to donate even the smallest amount of money is gonna put on for somebody adds to their possibility to pay rent and, or to, to put food on the table. 
Um, good. So thank you. Thank you very much. And as a small payback, I'm definitely also going to try to produce more of these live streams and share some uh, experiences and stories with you as well as I, I don't know if you could see really try to produce a lot of videos uh, about our cave exploration so that you even when you're stuck at home have at least the, possibil the possibility to dive a little bit through us or like see remember how nice the caves are when you see our videos good that was already it thank you for listening uh pretty interesting and nice picture that was from 2005 from the end of my cave diving trip uh when it was just after hurricane wilma and the water was all green in chuck mall and here i am again so uh thanks to all of you for listening now i could finally sit down again and not chase my office up and down uh thanks for your time sorry that it took so long in the test run that i did i was actually faster but once I start sharing stories like that and the memories come up, I get a bit excited and uh, so grateful and so thankful for all of the things that I had or got to experience in my life. And, and I'm really happy that I can share some of that with you. If you should have any questions about some of the things that I told you about equipment design or anything amongst that, just please, you know, don't worry. It's not like I'm super busy these days. So just drop me a, a direct message on, on Facebook or write me an email or or whatever and don't worry about any question uh, i'm always here to tell you what at least what uh, i think about it or to the the best of my knowledge okay i hope you have a nice rest of the saturday and uh, see you soon